Ave Maria. At that time, as Jesus was going to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside by themselves and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will deliver him to the Gentiles to be mocked and scourged and crucified. And on the third day he will rise again. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons, and worshipping, she made a request of him. He said to her, What do you want? And she said to him, Command that these, my two sons, may sit one at your right hand and one at your left hand in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you are asking for. Can you drink of the cup of which I am about to drink? They said to him, We can. He said to them, Of my cup you shall indeed drink. But as for sitting at my right hand and at my left, that is not mine to give you, but it belongs to those whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard this, they were indignant with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. Not so is it among you. On the contrary, whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, even as the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Our Lord is going up to Jerusalem. His disciples are following. They are anticipating the triumphant entry. They had been witnesses to the miracles that he had worked in confirmation of the teachings that he had given. They see that he is indeed fulfilling the scriptures, the prophecies relating to himself. They are certain of his power. Yet in the midst of this, our Lord speaks of his passion. Although they, he had already shown three of them the glory of his kingdom in the transfiguration, now he is, as he was coming down the mountain, he referred to his passion, and again, he, as he approaches, as he begins the journey to Jerusalem, he speaks of it again. So, in fact, this is the third time he has spoken of his passion, his death, and his resurrection. He doesn't speak to the crowds of it, however. It's only to the apostles, the twelve. And so St. Matthew tells, tells us, he took the twelve disciples aside by themselves. And he said to them, Behold, be attentive to what I'm saying. We are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes. And they will condemn him to death. They will deliver him to the Gentiles to be mocked and scourged and crucified. And on the third day he will rise again. So our Lord asks his, his, the disciples to be attentive. To what? To several things that are going to happen. He hides nothing from them. We, he said, are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man, but who is the Son of Man? They know that He's referring to himself because he has frequently referred to himself as the Son of Man. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do you say I am? And the first thing he says is the betrayal. He will be betrayed. Well, who would betray him but one of the twelve? Who will desert him but all except one of the twelve? 
And so he speaks of his betrayal first and foremost. And in this, there's a veil warning to Judas. But to whom will he be betrayed? To the chief priests and the scribes. In other words, to the authorities. They who ought to be able to discern the, the um, fulfillment of the scriptures. And they will condemn him to death. He will be brought before the Sanhedrin. And there was only one court in Israel that had this power, the Sanhedrin itself, the, the, the Council of the 72. Although the Council of the 23 had the power for lesser crimes. But the, since he's referring to the Son of Man, it's an indication that it's a Supreme Court and that the 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 um the the, the 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 um sentence would be in fact for blasphemy, which in fact is what ensued. But it's not just this. Not only will the chief priests condemn him, but they will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and scourged and crucified. So we have first of all the verbal abuse that our Lord would be exposed to, the mockery. And then there would be the physical abuse, the scourging. And lastly, there would be the execution, crucified. And on the third day, he will rise again. So our Lord is telling his disciples plainly what he is going to suffer. And in so doing, he's showing them that, one, he's not going against his, um, against his will, that he's freely and willingly embracing his passion. Secondly, that he's fulfilling the prophecies. Thirdly, that he's obedient to his father. Fourthly, that he could have avoided it if he wished, but did not. And so, having said this to the twelve, what we notice that it's at this point the mother of Zebedee's sons, Salome, comes to him. And we know her name from St. Mark's from Saint Mark's Gospel. And the request she wants to make a request of him. And he to bring it out clearly what her intention is, says, What do you want? And her response is allow, permit, grant to my sons to sit one at your right and one at your left in your kingdom. Our Lord hasn't spoken <clears throat> of his kingdom. He's spoken about his passion. Yet they know that his entry into Jerusalem will be a glorious one. But they think at that moment after his resurrection, if, even if they went that far, immediately the kingdom would appear and to be like the kingdom of David or the kingdom of Solomon, or at least the kingdom of this world. But as our Lord would say to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this kind. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my being um, uh, um, arrested and betrayed to the Jews. No, my kingdom, he says, is not of this kind. But the disciples, even they think it is of this kind. Of what kind is his kingdom? It is a spiritual kingdom. And because it is spiritual, it is above the kingdoms of this world. And indeed, it is very different to the kingdoms of this world. Yet we see something also that we should take note of, is that the disciples, James and John, did not approach the Lord themselves, but rather they had their mother intervene. We also have a mother who can intervene yet one who will not be concerned with our bodies, but with our souls of our eternal salvation. The one who told her son, they have no wine. And so we, if we go to the Lord, we ought to ask our mother in heaven, the mother of our Savior, to intercede for us, knowing that she will always ask appropriately. She will always ask and obtain for us what is conducive to our salvation. Our Lord answers not Salome, but rather her sons, because they are the ones who have instigated this. He said to them, 
you do not know what you're asking for. And indeed, they didn't know what they're asking for. For who can sit at the right hand of Christ? Who can sit at his left hand? Indeed, it is better to be at his right, for he himself says that he will divide men into two camps, those on the right and those on the left. But even so, we know as in, from, the, from the Psalms and the letter to the Hebrews that it is said, to which of the angels has he said at any time, sit at my right? So it's not possible for any creature to sit at the right hand of majesty. But nonetheless, there is a sense in which they are able to share the authority of Christ, for he has promised them to sit on twelve thrones and to judge the tribes of Israel. So it is this perhaps they are, they are grasping at. But this is not what, in fact, our Lord is offering us. He says, you do not know what you're asking for. You cannot sit there. But he says, for he doesn't wish to dissuade, we have ambitions, and the ambition in itself is good, yet it can be used perversely. And so he corrects the ambition, telling us what we in fact should strive after. Can you drink of the cup of which I'm about to drink? And so he speaks of the chalice, the cup. For him, it is a cup of suffering. And that is the only way in which our salvation can be brought about. In Scripture, the cup is generally that of suffering, though on a few occasions it is also a cup of blessings, as in the case, he has prepared the table for me in the midst of my foes. He has anointed my head of oil and my cup overflows. In that sense, it is blessing, but generally it is a cup of suffering. Let this chalice pass. And so the cup that he is to drink, he offers also to his disciples to drink. Can you drink of it? And they say, we can, not knowing that it is not even possible unless Christ gives the grace. And we ourselves know this from experience. For when some suffering is in the future, we are much disturbed and frightened by it. And when it is in the past, we reflect, well, what were we worried about? But it is in the midst of the sufferings that our greatest anguish is. So we need to remember that suffering is greatest only in the presence, whilst we are enduring it. And so he asks this. They think, yes, we can, because it's still in the future. And he says, very well, you shall indeed drink of my cup, but... For the sitting at my right hand, at my left, it is not mine to give to you. But it belongs to those for whom it has been prepared. Because our Lord will not give us anything simply on the, on the case of friendship or of our relationship with him. But it's always given on merit. In other words, we have to earn the, gift, <coughs> the gifts, or rather the rewards, that he has promised. We cannot obtain the crown if we do not engage in the contest. We cannot hope to, to be up, applauded for success unless we engage in the race. And so it is. What they're asking can only be given to them after they have won, engaged in the battle, and been victorious. And even then, it may not be for them, for we don't know who else is in the battle. Who else is in the race? Who else has engaged in the contest? And so, having then redirected their ambition, the, the ten, the other the apostles, they, when they hear of what the two had attempted, they are indignant. But our Lord also wishes to heal them of their misplaced ambition. For the apostles, for the two, it was a case of trying to get ahead of the others. And for the others, it was a case of envy. So he calls them, and he points out a very important message that applies to all. In this world, you know the rulers and the Gentiles lord it over them. Authority is made to be felt, and the people are fearful. Their great men exercise authority over them, but not so among you. In the kingdom, it is not so, for authority is expressed by service. 
Not so among you. On the contrary, whoever wishes to become great among you must be a servant. In other words, our greatness consists in offering and laying down our life for those over whom we have authority. Whoever wishes to be first among you must be the slave of all. And this, in this our Lord shows the difference between the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep and the hireling who is there only for what he can gain out of it. So then, in the kingdom, authority, true authority, is always manifested by service. And therefore, those, as we see, and indeed as we lament in the church, it does not seem that those who are appointed to be our shepherds have obtained it because of merit, because they have the desire to lay down their lives with the sheep, but rather because of the ideologies that they hold. And in this, we can see that they are not shepherds, but rather hirelings. And for that reason, we must again appeal to the Lord that he will send into his vineyard workers who will imitate him and who, like him, will be ready not to be served, but rather to serve and indeed to lay down their lives for the good of the flock, the flock that has been redeemed by the blood of Christ, by the passion of Christ, a flock that has been given eternal life because of his glorious resurrection. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Santa Maria.